What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kafinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in this week's episode is Elbridge Colby, co-founder and principal of the Marathon Initiative, an organization whose mission is to develop the diplomatic, military, and economic strategies that the United States will need to navigate a protracted era of great power competition. Bridge has worked in and out of government for most of the 2000s, and as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy and Force Development, was the Chief Architect of the 2018 National Defense Strategy, which was by some estimates the most significant revision of U.S. defense strategy since at least 9-11, if not since the end of the Cold War. This is an incredibly important conversation that you're about to hear today, because it's a conversation about the national security challenges that Elbridge believes we face as a country, the scope of those challenges, their urgency, and what is needed in terms of practical changes to our strategic objectives, the organization of our national defense, what we prioritize, and perhaps most importantly, our sense of mission, unity, and national purpose. We spend the first hour laying out the nature and scope of these challenges, as they pertain in particular to the Chinese Communist Party, and to the degree that it acts in unison with Chinese objectives, the Russian Federation as well. The second hour is broken into two parts, the first of which covers specifics on how to meet the challenge, while the second focuses on Taiwan, where Elbridge makes the case for why he believes that an attack on the island nation by China is not only likely, but may come much sooner than most pundits and military planners expect. The consequences of such a war would not only be destabilizing for the current equilibrium in Asia, but if not handled properly, could escalate into a global kinetic conflict with hypersonic missiles, space warfare, cyber attacks, and God forbid, the use of nuclear weapons with horrific consequences for humanity and the planet. Preventing such scenarios from unfolding should be at the very top of our list of national priorities. And today's conversation is meant to help inform you about just how salient this threat is and what we can and perhaps should do about it. As most of you already know, Hidden Forces is listener supported. I don't rely on advertisers or commercial sponsors. So the second part of today's episode with Elbridge is available to premium subscribers only. You can access that part of the conversation as well as the transcripts and intelligence reports to each episode by visiting our website at hiddenforces.io, selecting the episode that you're interested in and clicking on the premium extras, where you can then sign up to one of our premium content tiers. And with that, please enjoy this extremely informative and comprehensive episode on American national security with my guest, Elbridge Colby. Elbridge Colby, welcome to Hidden Forces. Great to be with you, Dimitri. It's great having you on, Bridge. Before we start our conversation today, which is going to be very wide ranging, as I've said to you, the subject is one that I find to be infinitely complex and also highly intangible, in part because of all the assumptions that go into it, you know? But before we go into all of that, I would love to know a little bit more about you and how you got into this line of work. And I'm curious also to know how you would describe what it is that you do. Well, good. Well, no, that's right. It's really great to be with you, Dimitri. And, and thanks. I, I agree with you. I think it is a, a highly, there's a, a lot of assumptions in this world. Fortunately, we don't have a lot of data about major power wars. So, but I think you know, as we were talking about earlier, I mean, I think what I hopefully try to bring in into the book is, and the, and the overall approach is sort of a rigor and try to make it as rigorous and kind of rational as possible and empirical wherever possible. But I mean, what do I do? That's a really good question. I, I kind of hesitate to say it because it sounds sort of pretentious or maybe even ridiculous, but I mean, I think what I am is a strategist, right? I mean, I'm, I'm basically trying and I'm focused on defense, but I'm really interested in you know, geopolitics, how, how states operate in the world, and particularly how America can make the best in conditions of uncertainty and ambiguity and change, uh, how, how do we do the best that we can? And I mean, to me, a, a, you know, a strategist, and I, I talk about this in the book, you know, really, it's more of like a, a framework for optimizing your results in, an, in that uncertainty and in those conditions of, of scarcity, as the economists call it. 
And I think that's a bit out of sort of that, that's gone out of fashion in the United States for a pretty simple reason over the last generation. We were so powerful. I mean, you know, in the, in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union, we didn't really have a strategy in the sense our strategy was kind of like ending, I mean, not to be sort of extreme, but like ending tyranny or ending evil or, or pacifying the world. I mean, things that were, you know, maybe maybe noble aspirations, but are not really like kind of concrete strategic objectives. And, and now that we're back in a much more competitive world in the same way that a kind of a market, you know, is a competitive, we have to make more intelligent decisions. And so I think that's sort of what I'm trying, what I'm trying to do. And in particular, in the area of war and peace, which is, in my view, you know, not only the most awful element of human existence in a lot of ways, I'm, you know, how many people can be killed? I mean, billions potentially, right? But also exceptionally consequential. We tend to, I, I analogize the 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 role of major wars a bit like like market um, you know collapses right I mean most of the time either they don't happen but when they do they really fundamentally reshape the whole structure and order that that we all operate in so you have to pay a lot of attention to them because you they, they shape everything you know forwards and their expectations shape everything so that's the kind of I'm trying to think about all of that so that we can position ourselves the best so that we can avoid a thing. In 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 the in the first place, but in a way that's consistent with our you know American people's interests. Yeah, you mentioned your book. The title of that book is "The Strategy of Denial." Did that book come out of your work at the Defense Department and your role as the lead architect of the 2018 National Defense Strategy? It did. It's interesting. I mean, the book builds on you know my thinking. I you know I've been in the national security and kind of field for the last 20 years since I finished college. I mean, I sort of always been interested in, in the area. And I, over time, I progressively become more and more interested in the kind of issues that are really reflected in the book. I was always interested in them, I, I, you know, even 15 years ago or more when I started writing about this stuff. But it's really crystallized my focus on China because it's the major other actor in the international system, you know, the potential for a major power war and how to avoid it, et cetera. The book really actually, in, in its sort of proximate sense, does come out of my experience in the Pentagon. So when I was in the Pentagon, under Secretary Mattis at the beginning of the Trump administration, we had the opportunity to develop what's called a national defense strategy. And for a lot of reasons, this was a unique opportunity that Congress had actually restructured the strategy making process in order to give it more, frankly, oomph, more rigor, more focus. And I sort of fell into this opportunity, but there was a real sense, there was a kind of an, a growing recognition that, that, you know, that sort of strategic holiday that I was talking about for the previous 25 years was now over. And that we needed a real strategy. And, and Secretary Mattis was very keen on this. The Congress was very keen on this. You know, President Trump was obviously changing the perspective towards China and other things. So it was a very opportune moment. And we were able in that document, you know, for a variety of reasons, happy to get into it, but to have a, a document that really called for change, that really reoriented the department onto great power competition, particularly China, and focusing on, you know, being ready to fight a war in order to, against such an opponent precisely in order to avoid it. The book actually comes out of my conviction, and this is a, a feature of the American system. Look, if we lived in, you know, Habsburg, Austria in the 18th century, you don't need to convince people outside of the emperor's court, probably, right? But in a large democracy where there are multiple centers of power, foreign policy is more concentrated, but it's still diffuse. You know, the Congress votes money and authorization of programs you know, leading intellectuals and, and columnists influence how the executive branch and others act. Allies and partners are really important to how we operate. My conviction was I need to, I need to, somebody needs to go out there and lay out comprehensively what our core interests are, why we need to focus on it, why we need to focus on China and particularly, and what we need to achieve in the military domain to enable all of our other interests to be, to be served. And actually, even in the defense establishment, you know, I mean, a lot of people are there and would say, I'd have all these conversations with generals and, and other civilians and saying, yeah, I get your point, Bridge, but I don't really buy it. And if people don't buy it, if they're not, if they haven't internalized the argument, they're not going to go, go forward. So my conviction is that on multiple bases, you know, from, you know, Americans, you know, in wherever they may be in the 50 states who are voting to allies making decisions about their defense and foreign policy, all the way to the you know Marines on the front line deciding how do we prepare to fight China in order to, de to deter this outcome, they all benefit from having a comprehensive, clear assessment. And to your point, Dimitri, it is complex, but what I strove for in the book was an accessibility. It's not necessarily an easy read, but it should be accessible to anybody. It's not a technical book, and it matters to all of us because war and peace matters to all of us.
Yeah, you kind of went right to the heart of one of the most important, I guess, themes of this conversation that I wanted to explore. And I was thinking about it in the context of the end of the Cold War. And again, you touched on it earlier when you said that we were kind of adrift. We didn't really have a a coherent, unified, agreed upon strategic direction and raison d'etre after the end of the Cold War. And I wonder how much of that was because we didn't do the kind of work that you're describing and how much of it was also just because being a unipolar power and being a kind of empire is really not in the American DNA. Well, look, I'm, I'm, and I mean this in a sort of colloquial sense, I'm, I'm a realist. I look at things, you know, I, and so I tend to look at structure. I mean, in the same way that if you look at a, why did IBM become fat and happy in the 1970s? I think it was because they were, they were fat and happy. They were the leading power and they got happy and they got arrogant in a way. And that's basically what happened to us. And I, I mean, there are people I think should, who really misguided the country, but they, in a sense, were more product of the circumstances and the structure, which is, you know, we were so much more powerful than everybody else. And the other powerful actors in the international system were largely allied with us. I would also maybe more hubris, you know, so we started to pursue goals that were really not you know, particularly connected to serving Americans' concrete interests. And, you know, people made arguments for why that was worthwhile. And those are debatable points in a condition of, you know, where like, what's the worst that can happen? We're so dominant, you know, say it's 1999 or 2003 or 2005. We're so dominant. What's the worst that's going to happen? Well, that's not the world we live in anymore. I mean, now we, we do have a peer economy for the first time in 150 years, and that's China. And by the way, there's other things going on, of course. China, who knows, the Iranians might be moving towards a bomb. So there's a lot going on in the world. And I do think accountability, looking backwards, is important because I think it's an important in- incentive and motivator moving forward. And I think people should understand what, what was the right course and whatnot. But I, I think we do need to focus on, on moving forward and making the best of the current situation rather than relitigating the past too much. Not that you are, but I think yeah, this does Yeah, yeah, No, I yeah. actually agree with that. So this, again, you're raising so many interesting questions for me. You know, just to put a cap on this or to explain to the listeners why I went back to the end of the Cold War and I wanted to pick up on what you said when you began this conversation is because I think that regimenting, convincing the American people to take on the types of responsibilities that you put forward in the book is uniquely difficult because of the nature of the American consciousness and psychology and history. I mean, it's a fascinating period, the 1990s, to consider because one wonders, I mean, in some sense, I feel like the end of the Cold War and the way in which we really were not prepared to pick up the baton in some sense is in many ways evidence for why we never really aspired to build an empire. You know, we, in some ways, were dragged into it. And yes, there are interest groups in the United States that have, that we're more interested in that than others. But I think it's an interestingly complex type of a challenge to confront on a cultural level in ways that I think was not true for the British or for other previous empires or world powers. I love what you said about us no longer being the only power in the world, that we have, as you describe in the book, a peer competitor in the form of China, but we have a number of countries in the world that challenge us in ways that really wasn't the case 20 years ago. And I think this is also very key, and I want listeners to really keep this top of mind in the course of our conversation, which is that many today still operate with the framework that all the things that happen in the world today are America's fault, that they basically derive from the mistakes of our strategic direction, from our you know forever wars, et cetera. Basically, people are, to your point, still litigating the Iraq war. And while I think that that's understandable, because I think in many ways, the people that were responsible for that war, or at least the way in which it was prosecuted, the ways in which the public was deceived, et cetera, have not been held accountable. And we never had a reckoning, which I think would have been essential to getting us past that phase. Unfortunately, we are where we are. And at this point, you know, it doesn't really make any sense to put your head in the sand, because I agree with the general framing that you put forward. So- Let's actually, just in, in, in order to kind of get the conversation flowing, let's actually focus on maybe to begin with the national defense strategy. 
which I encourage everyone to read, the one that you authored in 2018, because many of the philosophical things that you explore in the book are things that we're going to talk about throughout the course of our conversation. I'm curious to know a little bit more about how you got involved in this process, how much of a team effort it was at OSD at the time, and who in Washington, this one for me is also very interesting because I want to try and understand the scope of support for this perspective. I'm curious who in Washington generally supports the findings and recommendations that you put forward in the report. Oh, that's a great, there's a lot in there. So I'm not a huge fan of process, and pro- but I think it is important. And, you know, the national defense strategy, I mean, I think just to give a sense, and people can look elsewhere, and what's available in the open context is the unclassified summary of the national defense strategy that's available from the Department of Defense. There's also testimony I gave to the Senate Armed Services Committee, which is available online if you search my name and that kind of you know testimony stuff, you know, is also unclassified. But that gives also a sort of sense of it. What I would describe the National Defense Strategy of 2018, early 2018, under Secretary Mattis as, as having done is basically saying very clearly, you know, as Mattis put it, the focus on counterterrorism and by extension counterinsurgency and so forth is over. Now we're focused on great power competition. You know, China in particular, to a lesser degree, Russia, and also a kind of a focus on, as the title says, you know, sharpening the American military's competitive edge, which is to say there was a sense that our military edge, particularly vis-a-vis China and, and again, lesser degree Russia, had really eroded over 25 years because they had gone to school on us through things called like anti-access area denial. I mean, they'd really been focused on us. Meanwhile, we've been doing Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya and so forth and, and really lost the edge. Like, I mean, to go back to the IBM kind of context or GM of the 1970s, pick your example. And so the idea was get back, focus up on that. And in a sense to me, you know, it's a committee product. I mean, ultimately Sector Mattis's product under President Trump, like, but that's sort of a simple idea. How did that happen? I actually think it's a, and again, I'm, I guess I'm a bit of a structuralist. I mean, I came into the job sort of through a series of, I'm not even sure, but through, you know, as these jobs happen through a series of, you know, pinging around or whatever. And I was hired for the role of the strategy guy in, the, in OSD policy. But they had already, Mattis had already set up a structure where there was a direct report to the Secretary of Defense that I would basically lead. There was another guy from the Joint Staff who was involved, but a small team to do the strategy, to report directly to him, and then ultimately the Deputy Secretary of Defense. That was very important because the traditional process for, as you pointed out, the quadrennial defense reviews had been basically very bureaucratic. The military services would send teams of like dozens or hundreds led by general officers. And then there would be kind of basically the bureaucratic equivalent of trench warfare. There'd be a lot of arguing and back and forth. And then you'd get the kind of lowest common denominator inertia. And I think both the Congress and also Mattis recognized this was bad. This was not going to result in something that was fit for purpose, fit for the time. In a paradigm shift. Yeah. In a paradigm shifting environment in which there's geopolitical change, you know, you need something sharper. And so there's more risk involved in such a strategy. You could say, well, UFOs are the number one. I mean, well, we should probably put a little against the UFO problem in my view. But like, you know, you could decide Paraguay is our number one, right? So there's a higher beta, right? But I fell into that role. I was already of the mind that, you know, we need to focus on China in particular, and again, Russia as well, and shift and do less in the kind of Middle East and this sort of these forever war kind of things. And it turned out there was a small team that was allocated to work under us. And basically over time, we were able to work with Mattis and then Bob Work and then Pat Shanahan, the deputy secretary, the leadership of the department to get this kind of sharp change document. It did induce resistance, but by the time the resistance kind of mobilized, it was mostly formed. So I would say we got about 80 to 85% of the way from what I, at least I would say would be optimal, maybe even more, maybe 90. And that resulted in a, in a fundamental change document. And, and you know, Mattis deserves tremendous credit because he, ultimately at the end of the day, Bridge Colby saying something is not particularly interesting in the, in the Department of Defense context of 2018. Jim Mattis saying something's very interesting, that he's the Secretary of Defense and he has a tremendous amount of credibility in the military world and so forth. So that was really the, I would say, how the organizational element played out. And then in terms of who's in favor and who's not, I mean, that's a very interesting question. And part of the thing about the book is I wanted to carry the argument forward because the strategy is very much an internal facing document within the defense establishment. If you talk you know, to military people, they really got the message. I would say the strategy was very clear. How well the implementation has gone over the last few years is another matter. It's been good. I would say certainly compared to previous quadrennial defense reviews, it's had much higher impact. I think I can say that without, without fear of contradiction. But- the problem is you're not racing against yourself. You're racing against China and, and others. And that's where it's more troubling. 
the NDS was publicly well received, the national defense strategy was publicly well received, but the totality of what he was actually saying, I don't think is fully sunk in. And that's what I try to do with the book, which I think of as almost like a platonic version of you know, the NDS as a, as a government document. This is kind of like the pure statement, you know, the refined kind of like all the bells and whistles taken off. And that, you know, I think you can find the sources. I'll tell you the places of resistance would be, I mean, of course, there's this sort of part of the political spectrum that doesn't believe we should have a military that doesn't take it seriously. I mean, that, okay, it's going to be hard to convince those people, but they're relatively unimportant, frankly, in the, not to be dismissive, but they don't carry a lot of weight in how America actually makes its defense and foreign policy at the end of the day. It's kind of a throwing, you know, peanut gallery, and the peanut gallery is dismissive, but I mean, sort of it, Hmm. it's mostly criticizing stuff. And if you look politically, I mean, most, it's just not, not where most things are decided. Where I think the resistance is, rather, is in the need for choice and the focus on being ready to fight a military, a large war against China, and what is needed to actually achieve the level that's laid out in the book, and the consequences for you know, what we can and can't do. And that's very difficult for the American political establishment, and particularly the so-called blob. I mean, the term has a value. There is a blob. And the blob doesn't want, because the blob is used to being the unipole. I mean, you talk about Americans not being comfortable with the empire. That is true. Washington, D.C. loves the kind of liberal progress, you know, sort of empire. Sure. Washington is this, in a way, it's kind of like the imperial capital. People come here, they suffocate. You know, in a structural way, it's not that different than if you were in London or even Rome. You know, I mean, everybody knows this is where the big things are decided, but certainly were 20 years ago. It's tough to give that up. It's tough to give up. Hey, wait, but I've been working my entire life on the Middle East and Europe. And now you're telling me that we need to focus on China. That I, No, I don't, you know, and yeah. that's where the debate is right now. No, this is very interesting. It's kind of like a three prong problem. You know, one is the strategy itself, which takes a level of intelligence, effort, energy, which I imagine must have been very satisfying and meaningful for you at the time. Then there's also the actual, you know, implementation part, but then there's the the convincing part that comes in between the two and convincing the stakeholders, which again, this just speaks to the complexity of the task here. And again, the the intangible nature of it. So let's switch gears here to talk about or to flesh out rather the nature and scope of the challenge and the threat that you see and that you've written about in both the defense strategy document and in the book. Lay that out for me in the simplest, most coherent terms possible. What's at sure. stake here? Well, that's a great question. And, and I wanted to go back to first principles because I think, as we've discussed, we, we'd gotten unmoored from being very practical and concrete in what it is our foreign policy was actually supposed to do. Because we were so powerful in these time, we were basically like, we don't have to worry about what is the basics because the basics are, are not in question. Well, now they are. So, okay. So to me, I go back, what is the fundamental purpose of American foreign policy? And I think to myself, okay, we're constitutional republic, small r, right? And the purpose of a constitutional republic should be the citizens' interests, right? Obviously, their physical security, but also their freedom and their prosperity, right? I mean, in the Declaration of Independence, it says, you know, you know, all men are created equal and endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Basically, being prosperous and not, you know, worrying about your next meal and that sort of thing. So those are the sort of basic groundings. There may be other things that we seek to do in the world to make the world a better place, to make it more peaceful, to make it more equitable, et cetera. But those are not our core foreign policy responsibilities, right? Those are like additional things. Okay. So if that's the basic, you know, goods of American foreign policy, then what is the challenge to that? I mean, there are lots of things. There's obviously Pests, pandemics, pestilence, those are not things that defense state action can act against. But really what we're most concerned about in the modern world is somebody being so powerful that they could abridge our, to some extent, our security, but really more our freedoms and our prosperity. And that's just, you know, power is what ultimately matters. And again, I'm a realist, right? Because if you don't have power, you can't turn it into economic coercion. You can't turn it into military power. And, the you know, a thousand years ago, guys could ride off the step and overtake, you know, sophisticated states. That's not the the case anymore. In the modern world, basically, if you're productive, you have technology, then you're going to be able to turn that into power. Okay, so you look at the world, 
where is that a potential challenge? Well, the reality is, and you, you, know, you and your listeners will know this very well, economic productivity and kind of wealth, but really productivity is not randomly distributed. It's concentrated in a few areas, you know, North America to some extent, but really around the kind of periphery of Eurasia in particular, and above all now in Asia. I mean, there's a great McKinsey map from 10 years ago that shows the center of global economic activity. 100 years ago, it was in, in the North Atlantic. Well, now it's shifting back as it was in 1400 to Asia. And what's interesting there is it's largely a human capital issue. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's mostly about, I mean, not wealth per se, but modern economic power is obviously a function of productivity. Network effects and the entire sort of logistical chain that produces economic value. Exactly. Exactly. That's And if you look at the map, you know, and the lights at night kind of thing, you can see it. And, and of course, the real center of economic activity going forward will be that the maritime periphery of East Asia, Southeast Asia, and to some extent, South Asia. That's going to be upwards of 50% of global population in the future. So if somebody or something controls that and can turn that power against us, we would be in trouble. And in a sense, this to me, it's a power-based organization, but it, People say sometimes this kind of logic is very un-American. I actually disagree with that because the fundamental idea of the American political system is not necessarily, the Bill of Rights were an afterthought to the Constitution. The Constitution's core idea is separation of powers. Nobody should be entrusted with too much power because they will abuse it, right? I mean, that's just a good supposition. And that's the basic, the the same idea. Okay, so if we look out at the international system, is there anybody that can agglomerate the wealth of Asia under it? Well, yeah, there's China right, which is 20 to 25% of global GDP at this point and growing, depending on how you measure it. So just by deduction, that is the most significant challenge, just like theoretically from deduction. Europe, 20% of global GDP now, it'll be about 10% in 20 years. Russia, one-tenth the GDP of China. Iran, a pale shadow. Middle East, much less important. That's just how I look at it. So if China could dominate Asia, that, that pales in comparison. Now, is that theoretical? No, it's definitely not theoretical. We could live in a world in which China was run by Tsai Ing-wen, the the president of Taiwan. What I would be talking about would be a much more remote sort of theoretical possibility. It's not theoretical. Xi Jinping runs China. They clearly are are pursuing, I would say, regional hegemony, the minimum, and really global preeminence. They're not particularly shy about it. And they're building a military and, and so forth. So this is the scope of the challenge. And the thing that's really, I mean, to get to the point of the, both the nature and the scope, this is a two, three X bigger challenge than any of our rivals during the last century plus, right? I mean, China is an economy of equivalent size to our own. It may become substantially larger. We'll see over time. But in a minimum, it's roughly our own. The Soviet Union would never even approached it, our size or productivity. Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, and fascist Italy together never even approached our own, let alone us with the Soviets and the British Empire. Ditto, you know, Wilhelmine Germany. So we're, I mean, we're just different, dealing with a ho- totally different level. Is it of comparable challenge. to what the Brits faced in the 19th and early 20th century with Imperial Germany? Except, you know, one of the things about 19th century Europe, and there are a lot of, I would say, of the historical analogies, and none is perfect, the Wilhelmine Germany element is probably the closest. But Germany was never anything close to 50% of Europe's GDP as China is of Asia, right? You had Russia, you had Austria, you had Italy, you had France, you had Great Britain, right? So you there was the balance and all that kind of stuff. This is different. And remember that historically, before the European imperialism period, China was the kind of, you know, the Middle Kingdom. China wa- did have a sort of quasi-hegemonic position in Asia. So this is actually, in some sense, the norm. The problem is now in a global world, if China can control all that, they will. And I think we don't need to speculate anymore. We know what they're doing. We, we can watch what they're doing to Australia, and it'll be worse for us. So this is the nature of the challenge. Then the question becomes, how do we address it? And this is, I think, I think the conversation in the United States has moved a lot on China. Five years ago, if I'd said this, whoa, wow, that's so, you know, blah, blah. now this is kind of uncontroversial. The question is how to deal with it, how stark the challenge is. And that's sort of where I think a lot of the debate is now. And even if you look at the Biden administration, which I don't think came into office looking to make a big thing of China, I don't think that was their preference, but they have, or at least rhetorically they have. I think that's a product of their just having to grapple with reality. Yeah. So, so many points to respond to you on. Number one, I agree. I also think that for all the criticism, and I think much of it correct, though maybe overdone in terms of its tone, for all the criticism that Trump has taken, I think he played an instrumental role in really 
making this a big political issue because I question where we would be today if he hadn't done that. And so, so totally agree with that. Yeah, you know, in, in terms of historical comparisons, I think the comparison with Imperial Germany, it's a very interesting point that you make, which is that Imperial Germany was surrounded by other countries that were large and imposing and had their own historical relationships to empire building and to military strength, et cetera. Of course, the demographics were very different than, than they are now. And that's something that I'd like to explore when we get into a conversation of maybe stress testing some of the arguments that you make. But before we do that, I want to actually kind of understand this challenge a bit more in more detail, or at least your argument of it. And what has to do with the dimensionality of it, the scope of it? And this kind of speaks to the dimensions of warfare today and to the, again, intangible nature of this whole thing, which is that, yes, during the Cold War, certainly there was an element of propaganda between both sides. There was, of course, the forms of economic warfare, though not anything like what we have today because the economies weren't as interconnected. But there was no way for the Soviets, absent a nuclear strike, to really attack the United States and vice versa. That's not the case today. So I'm curious to understand, and I've heard and I've we've had many people on this podcast discuss their perspectives on how and for how long the Chinese have been waging one form or another of war against the United States, Russians as well. How do we understand the scope of this challenge and this threat? Look, I have what sounds a little bit like an old-fashioned point of view, but I think it's correct, which is that military power, and particularly decisive, direct military power, is the most determinative force in human life, right? Because, and this is, again, I'm a realist, like the most persuasive form of influence is lethal force, the threat of lethal force, right? I mean, as Thomas Hobbes put it, the passion to be reckoned upon is fear. Right. So if you really want to persuade somebody, especially to do something they don't want to do, you know, you can try influence and voodoo and propaganda and stuff, but it, my basic sense is it tends not to be structurally influential. It, it can help on the It's margin. also backed up by the threat of force. And negotiation and diplomacy happens in exactly. that context, ultimately. That's exactly what I'm going to get to, which is diplomacy without force is like a dance without music, right? What, what I'm saying is, is not saying that military force is the only thing. To the contrary, obviously, most of human life is not, but it's always shadowed, right? I mean, the analogy I like to use is the role of the police. We all know, or litigation, right? And that's the litigation is ultimately backed by the state's monopoly of violence, right? That like somebody has the power to take you to jail or whatever, if, if you got, right? That we all know if this escalated, right? This is going to go out a certain way. And we're so accustomed to it that we don't think about it anymore. And this is the, the term I use in the book is imagined wars, which is to say, and, and the Cold War is a great example, actually, is if you go and you read a history of what happened in Europe in the Cold War, you will not understand fully what actually was going on in the Cold War. Because during the Cold War, much of what it was, and particularly in Europe, were these imagined wars. So to your point about Soviets couldn't attack, particularly in Europe, which was the prize, Europe was the decisive theater. Most of what they were worried about is whether the Soviets could actually turn military influence into political outcomes. Most of what they were doing was trying to avoid that, including by military buildups. So if you look, oh, what happened? Well, there was the Berlin crisis and you know the airlift, and then nothing really happened. Oh, well, wait, but what were the Euro missiles? There were millions of people in the streets in West Germany and Italy and other places in Europe protesting the deployment of the Pershing missiles and the ground launch cruise missiles in the 1980s. Why? Because the NATO leadership was saying, if we don't do this, the Soviets will have the imagined war leverage to force West Germany or others to neutralize and basically do rent seeking. Like it wasn't like Hitler style, but it was going to be, they are going to be able to turn this all around. And that's what we have to worry about. And that's, I think, very important because we the thing you're talking about assumptions, you're right, there has never been a major war in the nuclear era, thank God, between real major powers, thank God, right? I mean, there have been proxy wars in Vietnam and Afghanistan and so forth, but never a direct war. So we don't know. But the problem is, it could really happen. And, and these people who say this war could never happen, well, we know, first of all, the Soviets and the, and the Western or the NATO allies 
We trained for war throughout. In fact, a big part of why we were training for war was to demonstrate to the Soviets that they couldn't get away with it. For instance, the famous reforger exercises, the return of forces to Germany in the 1980s. Those were designed to say, hey, Soviet Union, if you start a war, we will fight back and you will have costs that exceed your benefits. Today, both the American and the Chinese militaries manifestly prepare for war well, against each other. Case in point, that's, yeah, that's we don't happening. even have to look back into history. This is happening right now in Ukraine. The and entire exactly, diplomatic right. dynamic that has existed leading up to and then after subsequently was informed by the posturing of the forced posture of both sides. And in particular, what I think proved to be a much more convincing cohesion on the part of America's allies and NATO than perhaps Russia had been anticipating heading into Ukraine, which I think informs much of their response after the fact. I think you're absolutely right. I actually think the Ukraine example is really, in my view, vindicates my book's argument or my argument, which is military force is necessary if you're going to get somebody to do what they really don't want to do. Putin was not wrong that he needed to invade Ukraine to subordinate Ukraine because the Ukrainians didn't want to be part of his new empire, right? So Putin was correct about that. What he was wrong about was his ability to pull it off. Now, to your point, though, Dmitry, what is being shown is that what will almost certainly determine the outcome of this conflict when it comes is the state of the battlefield. And actually, I would say it's less the decisive factor is not so much the unity of the Western allies and so forth, which we'll see if that sustains. It's the fighting ability of the Ukrainians. Now, the Russians have found ways to go to their advantage in a more narrow set of goals. But I think what's really, frankly, saving the Ukrainians, it ain't sanctions, which aren't even, I'm not even sure they're working that well. It's not international opprobrium. I mean, more countries abstained or voted against the UN General Assembly condemnation of Russia than joined it. It's the denial by the Ukrainians of the Russians of their object. Now, they're supported by the Westerners with weapons and money and so forth. So I don't want to discount that entirely. But that's the critical variable. Yeah, I think this is super interesting. And I, you know, there's so much to get to, so I don't know how to work this in. But I just want to at least make the observation when we're talking about limited war, and we'll get into more detail of what that looks like. But I think that the tension here among the cohort of people, of Americans, who I think represent the vast majority, the cohort that doesn't want to have to get into a war. Among that cohort, there are those who think that what we should do is lay off, kind of back away, don't risk escalation by just doing less, walking away. And then the ones that actually have the opposite point of view, which is you need to, you need to press a certain amount. And I think the tension is between those two poles because you can overdo it and end up in a nuclear apocalypse or you can underdo it and end up in a nuclear apocalypse. In other words, stepping away can eventually lead to catastrophe because you put yourself in a corner and then the political circumstances at the moment would lead you to do something consequential and after which time you've conditioned your opponent to thinking along different lines. It's almost kind of like being a drug user and then going off of some particular medication for a long period of time and then overdosing when you take what you used to be taking on a regular basis. You, all these things are part of the game theory. So I just wanted to kind of make that point now just to have people think about that as we continue this conversation because part of what we're going to do here today is, I think, both put forward your argument and try to stress test it where we can. So the next question I have for you is focused on China. Because you identified China and it's at the core of your of your book as the major strategic adversary, as you said, its economy is 10 times larger than Russia's. And in many ways, it seems Russia is going to be playing an increasingly subordinated role in this sort of geopolitical context. I mean, you kind of touched on it a little bit with respect to China's strength. What are the sources of China's strength? And what are the core pieces of its strategic objectives as they pertain to US interests? And how confident are you in those objectives? And how confident are you in their resolve in achieving them? So what are the sources of its strength? And then their objectives. What are they? How confident are you in what they are? And how confident are you that they'll be able to achieve them? Absent some you know, meaningful strategic reorientation of the battleship in the United States. Okay, great. No, excellent. And let me just briefly say, I mean, I fully agree with you. You can't always be a hawk or a dove, right? I mean, War and peace are like, I equate it like to the Fed. You can't always be a dove or always be a hawk. You know, it's a matter of balancing. And, you know, I say this, I don't usually talk about my personal positions too much, but like, you know, 
I have been against every war in my adult lifetime, except the narrow mission against Osama bin Laden and the, and the Taliban and Al-Qaeda after 9-11 as a kind of punitive raid. I was against the Iraq war. I was against the expansion of the mission in Afghanistan. Basically, I was against the, the Syria intervention, Libya, et cetera. So I don't like war. In fact, my instincts are non-interventionist. But I think to your point exactly, it's the logic of the schoolyard. If you give, 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 you will just make the problem worse. And in particular, this is a logic... You know, the problem is that, that, that a lot of the sort of neoconservative advocates have, have cheapened the rhetoric of Munich and these kinds of things. Saying, mm-hmm. oh, Bashar al-Assad is Hitler, you know, Maduro of Venezuela is Hitler is ridiculous kind of things. And I'm not saying any, but it's like, that is a real dynamic. If you give, some people will take a mile. And if they're really, really strong, like China is, that's a very acute problem. So if you want peace, my view is you will have to go through. I mean, I was having this debate a little bit with Neil Ferguson on, on Twitter the other day. I actually think our long-term goal is detente with China because I, for a variety of reasons. But I think we will have to go through a tough, dangerous, risky period in order to achieve that objective. So I agree with you. That is a matter of the right timing and the right place. So I don't like to be called a hawk. I mean, I don't usually get called a dove. Sometimes I do, actually. I don't like to be a hawk or a dove because like, it's contextual. Who's always a hawk or a dove? That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. And I want you to answer the question next, but I I just do want to emphasize this. I completely agree with you. And I think actually this is a huge problem for us because so many people's political identities are built around this framework of a hawk Mm -hmm. or a dove, and they're informed by the invasion of Iraq and that whole period. And so many people are still litigating that and they're not able to get over it. Again, understandably, because many people weren't properly held accountable But we are where we are, and I am exactly like you. I was fervently against the Iraq war. I would have been described as a pacifist all the way. And so what I really want people to understand and keep top of mind, again, I want to reemphasize in the course of this conversation, is really thinking about what we talk about today independently of your biases and framings of American hegemony, of America's mistakes, et cetera. And just let's focus on what it is now. And then we can, throughout the rest of the conversation, we can also bring in those nuances. But back to those questions that I asked you. No, well said. What are the sources of China's strength? Well, on these kinds of questions, I don't pretend to be an expert. There are other people who know a lot more than I do. And I tend to go with something like the median conventional wisdom because I'm not a super expert on, on China or its sources of strength. But I mean, you look at just standard metrics of, China's economic development, and of course, its population size, and you know <laughs> your own lying eyes, right? I mean, I've been to China a bunch of times, you know, and like you can just see what they're capable of doing. And you look at Elon Musk has made a lot of money, and he's put a battery plant into China. There must be some reason for that, right? I mean, there's an immense amount of well, there's a lot of people, and they have basically cracked the code on modern economic development, which China had not done for several hundred years after the, after you know engagement with the Europeans and starting with Deng Xiaoping. They figured it out, and now they're you know whether you know whether they'll slow down or conk out, they're still going to be a huge economic superpower, right? The first one that's a peer of the United States since the late 19th century. So that's the sort of sources of Chinese strength, and I think do we have the edge in creativity and technology and our free system? Yes. They have, on the other hand, they're graduating in tons of engineers. Their educational system is getting better. It's no longer just a matter of of stealing American intellectual property. Obviously, that's still happening, I assume. But, you know, they have a lot of indigenous development. I mean, if you look at what, like Eric Schmidt's saying, they're doing a lot of indigenous AI work, you know, at the end. I mean, their work on electric powered vehicles is, from what I understand, ahead of the curve. So, I mean, they've achieved some kind of liftoff velocity, it seems. I mean, they're obviously exposed to the international market system as we are, probably less than they are, but but that's the sort of source of their basic strength. And I think we should assume that that will continue at least at some rate of growth. Strategic objectives. Strategic objectives. What are their strategic objectives? Well, again, for me, this is very deductive. And so my approach in the book is that I take things kind of from a rational deductive perspective, you know, looking at it from a kind of an optimizing black box axer. That is not inconsistent with knowing more or more expertise on, say, how China makes decisions or et cetera. I would say it's more of like, uh, analytically, it's like mine is sort of the pure, you know, just like rational actor kind of approach. And then you can kind of stress test that, if to use your term, with empirics and better understanding of how China's actually operating. I tend to think the rational actor model is pretty good, especially in looking at macro moves. So basically, if you look at the structural incentives of great powers and history, great powers usually try to establish a position in which they are dominant over a large market area where they can 
you know, basically have markets for their goods. They have more secure area. They have secure access to critical natural resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And that's what China's doing. So that, that's not a surprise. I mean, we did that. The British did that. Your political system doesn't make a huge difference, frankly. Like Tsarist Russia did it. The Soviet Union did it. The British had an empire that, one of the, that we and they were the most liberal systems in the 19th century, et cetera. What are they going for? I actually have a less ambitious sense of what they're trying to achieve. Some people who look a lot at the Marxist-Leninist ideology of the Chinese Communist Party think that they have like truly global and almost like unfettered ambitions. That could be right. Again, I'm looking at it more at a rational actor. I say what they would want is a dominant position over a large chunk of the global market, you know, and then from that position, they're going to be able to boss everybody else around. And then they're going to, what's going to accrue to them is all the benefits that we've enjoyed. They're going to have the best currency, which is, you know, they're going to pump up their prosperity in a sense. They're eventually the best universities, the best companies, their standards and regulations and sanctions are going to have to be abided by. Ultimately, people are going to probably start speaking Chinese, no longer speaking English so much. These are the things that we've become accustomed to that we think are natural, but are products of American you know, sort of leadership or a unique position in the international system. And I think this is what they're pursuing. So just to make the final point, what their goal is, is because Asia is the largest market area and they're already in it, what's rational for them, it's easiest for them to assume a hegemonic position over Asia, then they can basically be the gatekeeper for Europe and North America and the Middle East, right? Hey, you want to do business in Asia? You want to do business with over 50% of global GDP? Play by the rules, you know? And right now that means oh, don't say the wrong thing on Taiwan or Xinjiang. In the future, it's going to expand because human nature, as they get more stronger and there are fewer constraints on their ability, like George W. Bush or Madeleine Albright, their goals will expand. And that will be very bad for us because they have a structural incentive to knock us down because we are the only thing that really can stand in their way at the end of the day. Yeah, so I think it's objectively clear that the Chinese Communist Party has had aspirations that have differed substantially from those that we had for it when we worked hard to engineer it to bring it into the global international order. I think that's clear. But one of the things that concerns me is the distinct possibility that we could not only be making the Chinese 10 feet tall, that sort of um, traditional analogy, but that also that we're paranoid. And that we're paranoid because it's been kind of cooked into our DNA over the course of you know, the Cold War and subsequently. And because we've invested so much in becoming a military power and we're so used to being the biggest dog in the room or the biggest dog in the kennel, that we're conflating, in other words, losing that top position. And also we're conflating the anxieties of various interest groups in the United States whose livelihood and outcomes are much more directly connected to this with an overall national security threat. How do you navigate that, given the fact that even just now when we were talking about objectives, you are obviously not 100% certain on what those objectives are? Yeah. Well, great question. I try to trick my priors and my assumption or conclusions as much as frequently as possible. I mean, I think one of the virtues, hopefully, of my book is that it's a rational, accessible argument. I'm not making some argument about what the Chinese leadership secretly wants to do. I mean, I think you're right about the you know misreading of the Communist Party. But like what I'm saying is all logical. It's all the arguments all out there. So if people want to say you're exaggerating the the threat and so forth, you know, go for it. Yeah, but they wouldn't would be building is, up their military and yeah. expanding their presence in space and doing all these other things if they didn't have, if they didn't I, at I the very least, the yeah. Yeah, Look and look at how they're treating Australia. You know, I mean, they're demanding domestic legislation changes in Australia because the Australians had the audacity to call for an independent investigation of the origins of COVID. And they're doing it to us. Yeah, no, that's the other thing that's also concerning Elbridge, and maybe you can flesh that out too, which is that it isn't just the military dimension. It's also that there's a very strong ideological agenda that drives a lot of the behavior. And there's a strong sense of national pride that verges on right. kind of, I don't know what you would call it. And you've seen it with like the NBA, for example, right. the way in which the party really goes extraordinarily defensive around the perception of the CCP by foreigners, the perception of China. Like they really strongly yeah. manage that in a way that feels, I think, foreign to most Americans. 
Yeah, let me get to that. I want to make an earlier point about interest groups. I mean, I think you're right. And I'm, there are interest groups in plenty. I mean, there's defense industry and so forth, and they have interests that are not the same as the American people's. And I do think that there has been a great deal of threat inflation over the last three years. And I to, mean, just to reemphasize, again, the point that I made earlier, and many Americans are right, rightfully distrustful of those interests of the, quote, deep state, of all the various conglomerate interests that drive they're very understandably skeptical of arguments put forward by these institutions because right. of their track record. Yeah, and they should be skeptical. I agree with it. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I used to work on the intelligence reform stuff. I have a lot of concerns about our, our intelligence community. Now, my view is we need an effective intelligence community in the world that we're mm-hmm. going to live in. So you know, that to me is reason for accountability. And that's where I think you're exactly right. I just want to agree with you about accountability. It's very important to have accountability, whether that's formal accountability or it's saying to somebody, I mean, there are numerous people, just to digress for a second, there are numerous people in Washington who have huge platforms who were not only wrong about Iraq, but who called for like war with Iran, war with Syria. And these people are given national platforms, often for kind of domestic political reasons or whatever it is, or, or just inertia. You know, but it's not so. But I think accountability is important. I don't think it means that somebody who was wrong, about, I'm not infallible, I've been wrong about things, but it's like, I think people should sort of reckon with that and that should be factored in. I mean, and that's part of the decision. I do want to say, in the case of China, I actually think it's a bit of the reverse. So I think the blob, the elite institutions of American society, the financial community, for instance, Hollywood, other things, they tend to be pro-China engagement. The people who are worried most about China, and you've seen this in the Republican primaries on track the Democrat ones as much, but China is a huge issue. And I actually think this is an issue for that where, quote unquote, everyday Americans have a more acute sense because they have felt the impact. It's this like sort of looming omnipresence of like deindustrialization, a loss of control over your economic security. That's the beginning of what's at issue, that we will all be working. An example that I like, Dimitri, is... Today, many of us have different views about the social media companies and their role and what they should do. Essentially, all Americans are assuming that we Americans will be able to work out a solution that we come to. Well, if China is the dominant economy, all those social media companies will either be Chinese or owned or accountable to the Chinese. So we'll be in a much different and disempowered situation. There's a disempowerment. So I actually think we're now almost beyond the point at which people really are arguing about whether China is a threat. I actually think, and I mean, there was an article, for instance, in the Wall Street Journal a lot of blobby and elite financial people arguing for engagement with China. I don't think that's going mm. anywhere. You know what I mean? So I think that's a, a very important point. No, I think that's actually a really great point, and I completely agree. And, th- and that's totally true. And th- there are interest groups, of course, that have been driving, have been driving, and continue to try and drive a, I guess, a more. A, I don't. I don't know. The, the closest word I can think of is a. It's not accurate, though, appeasing, appease, an appeasement-oriented it's strategy. In, it's the engagement, yeah. but engagement's benefits have been localized. Let's not upset right? China. There's a kind of attitude of let's not right. upset China. Let's just do what we need to. Again, same kind of argument around – actually, it's a weird argument with Russia. The whole thing with Russia is actually interesting. Maybe I want to ask you this before we go into the second part of our conversation. Because like so many things, it's kind of similar to Iraq. Like I said, you know, I was fervently against the war. I was what you would describe as a kind of – progressive pacifist. And yet now I I have done many, many episodes on China and I have had concern about this issue for a very long time. Similarly with Russia, I was the person saying the Democratic Party specifically, because it was coming out from Democrats, it started with the Republicans. I remember the first time I heard it was with Mitt Romney. It was this kind of consensus view, heavily constituted in the Democratic Party for whatever reason, but then also among sort of more centrist Republicans, that Russia was this giant danger, you know, Putin, this constant demonization of Putin and turning Russia into this giant menace. And I was the person saying, this is ridiculous. You know, I was that person. But what I found now is that, you know, the the invasion of Ukraine, a lot of the folks that would have fallen in my camp have stayed in that camp. And they've kind of become like the quintessential example of someone like Oliver Stone. It's this weird thing of like, everything that America does is bad. Everything that Russia does is that it comes out of a sense of righteous aggrievement. Yeah, and exactly. I, I, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. so I, I, one is I'm just curious to understand where that comes from. Not that you're qualified to answer that, but I'm just curious to ask you that. And then on the larger question of Russia, not to relitigate because I don't want to That's not what I want to spend the precious amount of time that we have, but I am curious to know your overall thoughts there because it seems to me that given the nature of the challenge that we face with China, it would have been better 
if we had had better relationships with Russia. And it never seemed obvious to me that that wasn't possible. In fact, quite the opposite. It always felt to me like we went out of our way to impair that relationship. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, let me start with the second one, because I think I agree. And I talk about this in the book. Look, structurally, our interest is in having a Russia that even if it's not allied with the United States, which is probably not going to happen for reasons that are fairly obvious, at least a distance between Russia and China. I mean, it's like the basic you know, rule of American statecraft should be don't push China and Russia into a full-scale alliance. Bad, right? And it's clear, as you pointed out earlier, Russia is now the subordinate partner. They're completely, basically, you know, largely dependent on China. I think they've accepted their junior status. Now, let me just be clear. Vladimir Putin is a bad guy and the Kremlin leadership are a nasty group of people. Okay, like that's not the issue. But what are we doing here? We're looking after the American people's you know, security, freedom, and prosperity, and trying to do that in a way that doesn't involve doing things that are evil, right? But it's a tough world out there. Look, let's be honest. I mean, give me a break, right? Who was on our side in World War II? Joseph Stalin. And then who did we make a basic alliance with in the Cold War? Mao Zedong. I mean, we even spoke in favor, basically, of the Khmer Rouge when the Vietnamese invaded them in 1978, 79, right? So, like, let's, like, get over... And this is where some of the... To get to the Oliver Stone thing, the, the thing is a lot of those, that lane is like exactly, it's always negative about America. Sometimes they're very useful because they see and say things that are true that our sort of establishment can't process that we might not be perfect, right? Which obviously we're not perfect. Who's perfect? Isn't the whole American idea that nobody's that's perfect? Insane. Right? That's insane. No, it's, it's insane, it's totally right? insane. But, the standard but I agree is ridiculous. With you, like, and you go back, but I mean, you mentioned Iraq, but like for Oliver Stone, it's always Vietnam probably. And I mean, I, I think he had a point about Vietnam. I mean, I, I wasn't there. I don't know. But like we didn't handle it very well, right? I mean, I don't think it was worth it at the end of the day, with all due respect to those who who suffered and sacrificed so much there, you know, from a strategic point of view. But I think with Russia, look, you know, we should be clear eyed about what kind of leadership they are and it's likely to be in the future. I mean, if anything, what the collapse of the Soviet Union and Putin's rise showed us is that regime change, even of a nasty government like the USSR, doesn't solve your problems. I mean, Putin is a tougher guy to deal with than Mikhail Gorbachev was. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna have that, that's the reality. But how are we going to protect our strategic interests? What do we need? We need a balance of power. We don't want the Chinese to be too, have too much power, too much capability. And if they have a very willing Russian ally that's dedicating a lot of effort, that's bad for us. Now, how do we get to that point? I think one thing that's important, and I'm, I really pay deference in, on this and other things to my partner, Wes Mitchell, is just because you want to have a different relationship and even a sort in some ways a better relationship with someone doesn't mean that that involves, as you pointed out, appeasement or something. I think one of the problems is that, yes, I think in some ways we didn't give them enough sort of an homage or whatever, but in some ways we also projected, I guess, weakness, frankly. And so I think with the Russians, we need to convince them that they are not going to benefit from aggression in the West and kind of banging their heads on the brick wall of the West and then there's also some kind of an opening at some point. Now, I think given the war in Ukraine and and obviously the justified rage about that, I think that's not a near-term play probably, but it could be a medium-term play. I don't know exactly know what that involves, but that's the way we should be thinking. And again, I mean, Richard Nixon sat down with Mao Zedong and that was the right decision. I mean, Mao Zedong was a man of almost bottomless evil, right? I mean, he was a horrible person. He killed lots of Americans in the Korean War. But you know, there's a great Churchill line, and he was talking about Stalin. He said, you know, to beat Herr Hitler, I will even be willing to make a favorable reference to the devil in the House of the Commons, right? I mean, that's sort of, let's focus on what we're trying to do. And the ultimate morality, and I'm working on a piece on this, Dimitri, the ultimate morality of our foreign policy should be judged by what I, I point out as reasonably anticipatable consequences. Like, in a way that's like an investment decision, right? If you give your money for your kid's education and your investor says, but I invested it all in ESG, it was the right thing or whatever, and then he loses it all, he's not doing his duty as an investor. I mean, and I think we can see an example of this, frankly, not to be you know, too in the news, but, but the, the Saudi thing. I mean, it's just such, that is not, it's neither moral nor strategic, and that's the sort of worst outcome. Yeah, so I want to highlight a few things about what you just said, and then give people a sense of where this conversation is going to lead in the second hour. One, somehow this came up, I wrote down ideologues, and I think there is a danger of being too ideological. And one area I think where this is true is in the way in which American foreign policy has 
almost kind of unnecessarily gone out of its way to antagonize authoritarian regimes or regimes that we consider to be authoritarian or to have policies that we don't like. A great example is Saudi Arabia. You know, it's a complicated relationship because of also it goes all the way back to 9-11 and the role that the Saudi government seems to have played at the highest levels of government in the attacks of 9-11, something that has come out of um, the 9-11 commission or, or rather members of the commission who have spoken about this issue. And one of those is Bob Kerry, who we had on, Senator Bob Kerry, who we had on the podcast. One of the other things that comes out for me in this conversation, and it actually also deals with being ideological, too ideological, is also that there have to be things that we're willing to fight and die for, things that matter to us, that are a core part of who we are. And I think this is a real challenge because we're in the process within the United States of kind of overturning much of that. And we're having a kind of internal reckoning at the same time as we're dealing with this geopolitical threat, which is what, I mean, that's the three-dimensional, four-dimensional chess that we're dealing with. You know, maybe that there's an opportunity to explore that in the second part of our conversation. I love what you said about duty. And I think you kind of laid that out in the beginning when you talked about what the purpose of foreign policy is for a republic like the United States. It's to protect the citizenry and to protect in the most measured moral way possible the interests of the republic. And, you know, so those are some thoughts I had. In terms of where we're going to take this conversation next, the vast majority of it, I imagine, is going to be focused on how to meet the challenge because so much of your book is devoted to that. The majority of your book is devoted to that. And of course, to the NDS also. But part of that is also a conversation about limits. You know, how do we define victory? How do we define success in this struggle that could last decades? And what are the limits? You know, how do we avoid not scoring an own goal? Because that's what we did in, in the early 2000s. You know, in many ways, the world we live in today was shaped by the decisions and the strategic overreach of the United States in the early part of the 21st century. So how do we avoid that in this conflict? Those are kind of the core areas of the conversation where I'd like to take us next, Elbridge. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second part of today's conversation with Elbridge, as well as the episode transcripts and intelligence reports, head over to hiddenforces.io and check out our episode library, where you can also become a premium subscriber today. Elbridge, stick around. We're going to move the second hour of our conversation onto the premium feed. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to full episodes, transcripts, and intelligence reports, which include additional notes, resources, links, and other material that will help you get the most out of each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website at hiddenforces.io. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. <laughs>